Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the latest of Phil Fisher's Privacy Webinar Series. My name is Renzo Marchini, and I am a partner in the Privacy Team in London. Thank you so much for joining us. Today's webinar is called Unpicking the Proposed UK Regime on International Data Transfers. Divergence from the EU, perhaps. Uh, when I last shared a webinar a couple of months ago on the EU SCCs, I commented on how fast moving the world of privacy had become. Although we're now a week away, or actually less than a week away from the deadline on the first transitional period of the new SECs, there is no rest in sight for privacy professionals. We have an ongoing consultation from the ICO on data transfers, the subject matter of our webinar today, but if that's not enough, we have the UK government starting a wider consultation of a more profound change to the UK privacy landscape. So today's webinar covers the ICO initiative. Um, there are three parts to this, and I'm delighted to be joined by three colleagues who are all directors in our team, taking one part each. Uh, Nuria Pastor will cover the new UK SCCs, or shall I call it the IDTA, more on that later, how they work, how they differ from the EU's, will they be used? Um, Michael Brown will take us through a wider ICO uh, proposal, um, proposed change to guidance on what actually it means to talk about a transfer. Last, but certainly not least, especially because she's a late swap and late substitute for Kate Partridge, who's unfortunately unwell, Kirsten Whitfield will talk about the ICO's approach to undertaking a transfer risk assessment, of course, the subject of much discussion over the last year following the SHREMS decisions. Uh, we'll finish, as always, within the hour, that is at 5 p.m. Um, be but before we come on to the substance, I have a few housekeeping points about our webinar. Please do ask us questions as we uh, go along. And there's a question function on your screen. Um, I might be able to take some of you as we go through at the appropriate point, but there'll also be some time at the end. If we do run out of time, we'll try to respond to all questions posed in writing. Um, no need to scribble too much down because we will be circulating a copy of our slides and indeed a link to our recording. Our webinars, as a lot of you will know, are recorded and put on YouTube on our channel. So subscribe to our channel, subscribe to our blog and look out for more webinars over the coming months. So um, today's agenda, so I'll kick us all off by setting the scene. Um, then we'll have Nuria on the UK SCCs, then we'll have uh, Michael on a wider consultation, followed by Kirsten on transfer risk assessments and questions at the end. So setting the scene, so the ICO consultation now has been going on for, or since the end of August, I think, and expires on the 7th of October. So those of you that are interested in replying to the consultation, um, you know, please do put your comments in before that date. It covers three elements, which are the three elements that we'll be talking about today. Um, an alternative to the EU SCCs, the International Data Transfer Agreement, to replace the old documents that we know and love from 2001, 2004 and 2010, which, as you will know, despite them ceasing to be valid for new deals for the EU from next week will carry on being usable in the UK. It also covers, as I mentioned, a update to guidance on international transfers and a consultation lastly talks about how to handle um, uh, risk assessments for SHREMS. Now, the timing of the actual changes, um, the consultation will end in October 2021. Um, I, there's nothing published officially in, in, in regards to how long it will take to, to conclude, but one hopes that the UK, the ICO, won't take as long as the European Commission did, who put a document out for consultation in November, which November last year, which then saw real SCCs in June of this year. So, you know, a couple of months, but then once the consultation has being considered, the comments considered, and new documents finalised, the ICO is obliged by law to lay them before Parliament for 40 days, and then they become effective. And the ICO is consulting on all this, but they are proposing that, like the EU has done, that old SCCs can carry on being used for new deals for a period of three months, 
Um, but at the end of 24 months after final adoption, at the end of that parliamentary process, um, all transfers need to be repapered. Um, we'll come back to the use of EU SCCs um, uh, you know, for, for UK transfers. Uh, but just to give you a sort of trailer for that, the good news is that it is likely to be possible. We hope it survives consultation. We're telling our clients that it, it's likely to survive consultation to use EU SCCs from the UK if you've got you know, wider issues than simply UK only transfers. Um, one slide though briefly on the wider consultation piece which I mentioned at the beginning. So this is not the ICO that's consulting here, it's the government. Um, you know, the Department of uh, the, the, the DCMS has issued a quite a hefty paper on how it's going to um, unshackle itself from the red tape bureaucracy of EU data protection law and allow business to flourish. Um, and they give, you know, it, it's a big wide ranging proposal to rewrite data protection law in the UK. And, um, and who knows which of these will actually finally see the um, you know, hard letter law once it's gone through consultation and parliamentary scrutiny. But to give you some examples of what it covers, um, there's criticism of the legal basis regime and the difficulty of relying on legitimate interests. So some interests will be hard coded in without having to do an assessment as being legitimate. So you know, use of data for anti-fraud purposes, for example, um, analytics purposes, for example. Um, there's going to be a loosening of the criteria surrounding um, use of data for scientific research. Cookie consent, cookie consent banners will be removed for many innocuous uses of, of particular interest to a lot of clients dealing with SARS. The, the possibility of charging for SARS when they actually involve a tremendous effort to actually go through all the documents that might be found in a particular search. Um, a more flexible adequacy regime. Now, will the UK actually be conferring adequacy on jurisdictions around the world like confetti? I mean, if it does, what would that do to the UK's own adequacy in EU's eyes? Actually, what will a lot of this do to that adequacy assessment? That will be, I think, a concern for a, a lot of operators. Um, there will be a relaxing of the accountability requirements in GDPR. You know, do all the companies that currently are mandated to have DPOs actually have to have DPOs? Are so many DPIAs actually needed? Article 30 records, you know, they're going to be more or less scrapped according to the proposal as published. Um, the ICO is going to have a remit not only to look after data protection rights, but to promote business in evolving new, innovative and responsible ways of using data. How is that going to look? And is that, how is that going to look, going back to the point on EU adequacy, of having as a requirement for getting the adequacy assessment of the UK, a strong independent privacy regulator? Anyway, the aim of the government here is to encourage innovation at the same time as protecting privacy. And no doubt we will be coming back to this in a future webinar, but now turning back to the main meet of today and the UK's consultation and over to you, Nuria. Thank you, Renzo. Um, food for thought, there's, uh, there's, I'm sure about that. But yeah, as you say, let's focus on the, um, the UK SECs or, or as, as we say, the, um, the UK term, which is the IDTA. Um, let's move to the next slide, please. So I guess the, the first thing we need to we need to think about is what what is this? What is the IDTA? Um, so this can be used uh, as an instrument for controllers and processors or subprocessors to legitimise transfers outside of the UK to a non-UK based controller. That's sort of the headline. But actually, um, it's not as simple as that. Not all data transfers outside of the UK will require an IDTA, only the restricted transfers. And so what do we mean by that? 
Um, as part of its consultation, the ICO is exploring whether cer certain data transfers will, need, will indeed be considered restricted transfers. For instance, um, will transferring data to an importer who is already subject to the UK GDPR be a restricted transfer or not? Um, Michael will tell us a bit more about this later. But so th the question of who may be using the IDTA as, a, as an importer or as an exporter remains open, as you can see. And this will be clarified at the end of the consultation. But in broad terms, the IDTA will be used by exporters in the UK or outside of the UK who are subject to the UK GDPR and importers that, um, who will be legal entities outside of the UK, not in an adequate country um, that are entering into contracts with the exporters. So what? Um, moving on to the, the, the table on the right-hand side of the slide. So what type of transfers will be covered? So here, before I move on to, to discuss um, what type of transfer will be covered under the, the IDTA, Let's take a step back and recap what type of transfers are covered under the EU SECs. So as we know, there are four modules in the EU SECs and they cover controller to controller transfers, controller to processor transfers, processor to subprocessor transfers and processor to controller transfers. Here, what we see in the, in the UK, um, the approach is a bit more nuanced. So we have more types of transfers that are covered and these are listed here in, in the slide. The first few transfers, as you can see, coincide with, um, with the modules one, two, and three of the EU SECs. So we have controllers or joint controllers to other controllers, so to a third party, which is not a processor. We have uh, controller to uh, or joint controller transfers, it's a bit of a tongue twister, to uh, processors, um, processors to sub processors transfers. But then we have other types of transfers, which I expect in practice will be less common, which are the uh, processor to a UK controller to a third party, which is not a controller or a subprocessor, subprocessor to subprocessor transfers or subprocessor to third parties who are not controllers or um, their, their own subprocessors. So the, the net result is that I think, generally speaking, mo the majority of the transfers will covered will be very similar to the ones covered by the EU SECs, as I said, with the exception of the transfers covered by Module 4, um, which are the, 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 uh, the processor to controller transfers. Um, so um, one of the main differences, though, between the, the UK IDTA and the EU SECs is that under the EU SECs, there are some common clauses but then generally speaking, the terms are set by module. Whereas here, what I, what I wanted to, to, to make very clear in the slide and is that here we have one set of terms. Um, there are no separate modules. All clauses apply to all types of transfers that are just listed with some exceptions. But when the exceptions apply, they are um, set out in the clause. So you actually, it looks, it has a very different look and feel because you are looking at one set of clauses. Um, and yeah, as I said, some of the requirements do not apply, for example, to the pro to processor and subprocessor transfers. But but uh, by and large, all all clauses apply to all transfers. So as we can see. Um, and and uh, let's let's move to the next slide. It does look, even though it, it's meant to cover the same type um, restrictions, and it's meant to uh, be signed by, by similar sort of types of parties, the, the document looks very different. It's a very different instrument in terms of the look and feel. So let's take a look at at the the UK IDTA at a glance. What what does it look like? So it's divided in four parts. So part one contains tables for the for the parties to fill in, and the content of these in in these uh, parts overlaps with some of the content in the appendices of the EU SECs. However, this um, set of tables in part one are much more detailed. So let's have a look at the different tables that we have in part one. So firstly, we have um, table one, which details 
the you know where you provide the details of the parties then in table two you have the transfer details and this includes quite a lot of information including things like the governing law the place for legal claims um, for example the the role of the importer so will the importer be a controller a processor a sub processor or something else also, in, in, this, in table two, you need to determine whether the importer is subject to the GDPR, to the UK GDPR or not. So as you can see, um, some of the information in table two may actually, actually, it's not just a sort of a tick box exercise. It will require that you've carried out um, a legal assessment and the ICO um, advises, you know, maybe to seek, to seek legal advice um, in, in relation to some of these um, items. Um, table two also um, requires you to provide information about what the ICO calls the linked agreement. And the linked agreement is the commercial agreement between the parties that will be supplemented by the IDTA. So for example, um, a services agreement. Um, table two will also include information about the term of the contract and the ending date and whether the importer, may, the importer might carry out onward transfers and the conditions for it. And for example, how often will the contract be reviewed? So as, as I said at the beginning, table two will include quite a lot of meaty information in relation to the transfer and, and how it's going to be handled. Um, table three, it's very similar to the um, appendix one of the SECs, includes information about the details of the data process, the data subjects, the purposes of the processing. And um, the IDTA very helpfully allows for some flexibility as it allows for the content of this table to be linked to the agreement. So rather than providing all the detail here, you just link it to another document, so the, the linked agreement, which uh, may already contain all of this information. Table four is a table where you will set out the security measures. I won't go into detail. There is also a list of types of security measures, so not too dissimilar uh, from the approach in the EU SECs. And actually, there is additional information also in the ICOs, FAQs, about the type of security measures um, that um, should be included there. Um, let's have a look at part two. Part two, um, you will have to include the extra protection clauses. So what, what are these? These um, will describe the measures that you have decided to put in place as a result of your SHREMS um, transfer impact assessment. Um, the template does not need to be used and the ICO says that if your additional measures will, will only be security measures, you can just remove part two and, and provide a description of the security measures in the uh, table in part one. So again, there is flexibility here. Part three will include commercial clauses. So again, these are additional clauses that the parties may wish to, um, to put in place. And um, again, um, you may just, um, rather than provide clauses here, just re refer back to the linked agreement. So um, moving on to part four, which is the part that includes the mandatory clauses. Um, these cannot be changed. So similarly to the EU SECs, um, there's no flexibility here, with the only exception that obviously if you have added other clauses in the, um, in the, part, uh, in, in the earlier parts of the contract, um, you may need to make some changes in order to cross-refer um, the different um, clauses of the contract, or you may want to remove the sections that don't apply um, to you, or indeed what you can do, like um, with the EU SECs, you can add parties and you can make this a multi-party agreement, in which case you are a, you know, you will be able to change the contract. Um, so having seen this sort of overview, let's move on to the next slide, please. Thank you. So let's um, look into some of the specific elements of the um, IDTA. So we have two, two, um, two slides, uh, the what's good slide and the what's bad slide. The what's good slide has more items, so that, that's a positive, a positive message here. Um, let's look at the, the first uh, point. It's the point on flexibility. So this is, um, if you've had the opportunity to look at it, you will have seen, is a lighter document and it's written in plain English. 
which is to be welcome. As I said, the ICO will allow flexibility in the format, in the format and, and the content, um, not so for the part four clauses, but generally speaking, there is much more flexibility in the way in which you, you can um, put the contract in place. Um, the second point I wanted to make, it, relate, it relates to the Article 28 um, control to process clauses. Um, in the um, UK clauses, these are not included, which means that the controller to processor or processor to subprocessor arrangement, um, so the Article 28 clauses will have to be included elsewhere. The advantage here is that then you don't have to, you don't have the headache of having two sets of Article 28 clauses, which may conflict with each, with each other um, on, on issues as delicate as um, subcontracting or audits and, and so on. So again, this allows us for more flexibility and uh, makes things easier for um, companies wishing to use the clauses. In terms of onward transfers, the UK IDTA makes no distinction between onward transfers and appointments of subcontractors. Um, the, the table in part one allows for a general permission to carry out onward transfer and doesn't seek to replicate um, Article 28. Um, this is much a much more streamlined approach if you compare it with the um, with the terms of onward transfers under the EU SECs, which would include a number of complex and interacting provisions, as I'm sure you, you're all aware. Um, so the, the UK approach seems to be simpler to navigate, but of course the Article 28 of uh, the UK GDPR will still always need to be satisfied. So um, there won't be, uh, the bottom line will be that there won't be a substantial difference in terms of the, the, the content of the obligations. Um, moving on, um, the EU SECs include an unrealistic requirement for sub, a subprocessor importer in module three to inform the ultimate controller of any uh, further sub subprocessors. And the, the UK version um, of the clauses or the, the uh, IDTA is more realistic as the subprocessor does not have to do this. In terms of individuals' rights, there is explicit reference in the IDTA about the UK Data Protection Act and the exemptions that may apply in relation to individuals' rights requests. So this makes perhaps the document a bit more user-friendly and a, a reminder that exemptions may apply. In terms of um, data breaches under the IDTA, the importer who is a subprocessor has to assist the ultimate controller in breach, um, in you know, in case of a breach, um, obviously if asked. Whereas under the EU SECs, the importer has to notify the ultimate data controller directly, where and it's caveated where appropriate and feasible. But it obviously seems that the requirement under the EU SECs is much more onerous for um, importers here. In terms of audit rights, um, again. Um, there is no repetition here because the audit rights in the linked agreement will also apply to, in, to the IDTA. This minimizes the risk of overlap and conflict, and it means that on-site audits may not be required, um, which is actually something, as you will know, that is a requirement under the EU SECs. So again, this is um, this allows for more flexibility. There is also a new, a, a new interesting development, which is an optional arbitration clause, which will, um, the ICO has stated that it, it may be a faster means of resolving um, issues surrounding international data transfers. So we will have to see if this stays, how this applies in practice. And in terms of um, limitation of liability, um, clause uh, 6.2 sets out that nothing in the IDTA can limit the parties' liability to the individual or the ICO, which can be read as assuming that the liability between the parties can indeed be limited. And the final point is the point I made earlier as well about, you know, um, the document is a plain English document and there is a very helpful set of FAQs. Um, let's move to the next one. What's bad? Um, 
it's not very as a document because it's quite different from what we have in place now so uk exporters will have um, data transfer agreements based on eu secs so if they wish to move to this um, document it's not going to be a, a copy and paste exercise because it, it is very different um, in terms of the um, transfer risk assessment, this will have to be carried out up front because, as I said earlier, you may um, conclude that you need to um, carry out some uh, or put in place some additional measures, and this needs to be documented here. And this departs from the um, SEC, EU SEC's uh, approach where you can, if you look at Article 14, you can imply that it, it is understood that the um, the transfer impact assessment will be carried out after the contract is in place. Um, the next point is an interesting one on controller and processor characterization. So what the IDTA ex expressly says that if the parties choose the wrong description or if, you know whether the, the parties are a controller or processor um, or as to whether the importer is subject to the UK GDPR, and it, so if that choice or, or that is wrong, the wrong choice will be ignored and the facts will apply. So while we know that, you know, when it comes to controller processes characterization, what matters are the facts and not what the contract says, um, this nevertheless is a reminder that other terms may be in place or may apply without the, almost the parties realizing. So what the um, IDTA sets out is that the parties and the individuals may enforce the terms that apply to the correct option. And even though, um, you know, this is uh, makes sense from a compliance point of view, if you like, um, it, it might be tricky because, as you all know, whether whether you know the controller and processor characterization is not always clear cut uh, very often um, companies are in a gray area so that might um, lead to some uh, difficulties in the future in terms of implementation um, the last few points so the I um, the IDTA sets out that the importer has carried out uh, reasonable checks on the uh, on the sorry, the exporter has carried out some reasonable checks on the importer um, and these um, will apply regardless of the role of the importer. So that's probably going to be done in practice in the, um, in the transfer risk assessment. And then in terms of um, returning the data, the next item, um, the clause is set out that the data must be returned and there is no actual recognition that the importer might actually have an obligation under the law to keep the data. Um, so, you know, as, as you know, if you are in a regulated sector, that might be something that applies to you. So we expect that this is probably going to be corrected in the final version of the um, IDTA. Um, the next point is in relation to the ICO, bringing contractual claims. This is something that we haven't seen before. So the, the ICO may bring contractual claims against the exporter or the importer for breaches of the contract. And again, this is a, a new angle to regulatory enforcement and we'll have to see how, you know, whether it stays in the document or on how it will apply in practice. Um, one thing that is um, not very helpful either is the fact that um, the, um, it seems that the document will have to be, the, the IDTA will have to be um, reviewed on a regular basis and revisited at least once a year, which as we know, when you have a lot of contracts in place, uh, makes um, things quite challenging in terms of the amount of work that you need to do. And the final point is um, the limited use. Um, and whether this this is going to actually this this um, the IDTA is actually going to be used or, or, or not at all. And as Renzo said earlier, um, there there might be the possibility if if it survives the the consultation, which we think it will, that organisations may be able to use um, the EU SECs plus an addendum um, as an alternative to the IDTA which means that many organizations may, may wish to do that, especially global organizations. So, Renzo, if we move to the next slide. Thank you. Before that, can we just take one of the questions that's come in? A couple have come in sure. already. Um, 
the, the question is, you, you mentioned in the um, what's good bit, Article 28 clauses not included, conflicts less likely. Um, yeah. But the question is, um, you want Article 28 terms need be needed to be included somewhere? And what do you think the practice will be? Yeah, it, it will be in the, um, uh, there's actually, there's reference to these in the ICO's guidance and it will be, I think in practice, um, it will be included in the linked agreement. Yeah. Um, so check, uh, the next is is uh, check out our blog. Um, Renzo and Emma, a colleague of ours, um, put together a very interesting blog on the IDTA and um, I provided the link here. And also there is a link uh, within the blog to a table um, that provides a more detailed analysis to the one I've rushed through now in relation to how the, the um, IDTA and the EU SECs compare um, and some, some elements of, of them. So by all means, take a look. It's an interesting read. And I think this is, yeah, this is my, my last slide. So I think I'll probably hand over to Michael now. This, I've already covered this briefly, and this is about are, are, is the IDTA going to be uh, applied in practice or not? Or especially, and I think it will be for UK um, only organizations or maybe some public sector organizations that are required to, to do so. But if um, global organizations are actually able to rely on the EU SECs plus a UK addendum, um, I think in practice that's probably what's going to happen um, in order to minimize the number of contracts that are in place. But um, Michael is going to explain about this in more detail, so I'll hand over to him. Thanks. Oops. Thanks, Nuria, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks, Renzo, for changing the slides there. So setting aside the IDTA and transfer uh, risk assessment, if you're just able to move back, Renzo, Sorry. thank you. No problem. So setting aside the IDTA and transfer risk assessment, I'll now walk you through um, the four other key issues of the ICO's consultation. And in keeping with the purpose of a consultation, there's plenty scope to debate and theorize in relation to these topics. And indeed, we've been unable to resist doing a bit of that internally at Field Fisher. Um, however, for the purposes of my section, I'll try to focus on uh, the practical implications for businesses with an eye as to what might emerge unscathed from the consultation. So the four issues are as follows. Uh, one, the much discussed UK addendum to model data transfer agreements, uh, most notably the EU SECs. Uh, two is the UK GDPR's extraterritorial effect. Three is the concept of what constitutes a restricted transfer and thus becomes subject to applicable requirements around data transfer agreements, TREMS to transfer impact assessments, supplementary measures, etc. And then finally, um, issue four are the derogations to the restricted transfer requirements. These include uh, explicit consent and contractual performance between a data subject and a controller. So we can move to the next slide, please, Renzo. So the UK addendum, so what is its purpose? Well, the concept is that for transfers from the UK, Instead of using the IDTA that Nuria discussed, discussed um, organizations could use the UK addendum plus EU SECs or model data transfer agreements approved in other regions and the ICO sites, the likes of New Zealand and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations as examples. So what are its contents? What, what's it look like? Well, it's a short document at four pages and has been drafted uh, to refer specifically to the EU SECs. Um, it includes a handful of UK specific definitions, such as UK data protection laws and the UK GDPR. It then makes various common sense amends to the EU SECs for UK purposes. So, for example, a uh, competent supervisory authority is modified to information commissioner's office, governing law and jurisdiction becomes England and Wales and, and so on. 
crucially, it also includes language at clause 11 that, quote, the parties may amend this addendum, provided it maintains the appropriate safeguards required by Article 46, the GDPR for the relevant transfer, unquote. So this seems to provide some flexibility in the same way as the EU SECs for parties to agree um, provisions on kind of commercial related issues. So how does audit apply in practice so long as those appropriate safeguards are, are still maintained? And then finally, and, and helpfully, the addendum includes a section explaining that it can be entered into um, in any way that makes the addendum legally binding on the parties, but still allows data subjects to enforce their rights. So examples provided in the addendum include setting out some standard language in Annex 1A to the EU SEC, so flexibility on, on execution. So will it be used in practice? Um, the short answer is yes, um, with the caveat of it materialising in, in similar form, obviously following the, the consultation. And on that, whilst we don't have a crystal ball, it, it does seem to have been kind of positively received from stakeholders. And so we're hopeful that it will um, survive in kind of similar format. Nuria helpfully explains some of the reasons uh, for the, the utility of the document. Um, and it, it, it does seem to be an effective solution in terms of familiarity. So companies will know the EU SECs better than um, perhaps the IDTA. And also in terms of uniformity. So companies can apply internal controls, policies, frameworks according to the EU SEC's position rather than EU SECs for EU transfers and IDTA for, for UK transfers. So final and perhaps key question in this section. So should you use it now in conjunction with the new EU SECs? Well, as most of you know, we're currently in a slightly uh, sticky but, but necessary kind of transitional period. So from the EU perspective, lots of people are working hard on their, their new EU SECs related drafting ahead of, of next week's deadline, following which uh, the old EU SECs can't be used for, for new arrangements involving EU transfers. Um, however, from a UK perspective, clearly the, the position on, on transfers isn't final. So during the, this, this period, is there a means by which we can kind of cover UK transfers in paperwork whilst also um, building in the, the new uh, EU SECs? Well, we think there is a way and there's kind of three um, main elements to the drafting. So the first element is that the old um, EU SECs can apply for UK transfers for as long as it's lawful to do so. So his explanation, uh, evidently post-Brexit, the UK can't use the new EU SECs, um, but the old ones can be used until the position on the IDTA, UK specific amendment addendum is settled. The second element of the drafting is that where it's no longer uh, lawful to rely on that first element, um, then the UK specific addendum is incorporated by reference um, and the EU SECs are applicable for UK transfers. And then the third and kind of final element of the drafting is that if neither element one nor two apply, um, then the party shall cooperate in good faith to implement appropriate safeguards for transfers as required or permitted by um, the UK GDPR without without delay. So this is kind of fallback language in the hopefully unlikely scenario that the UK addendum is scrapped. Um, and as I say, surprised if that would happen uh, given, given the feedback. So Renzo mentioned timings um, and yet the, the, the UK consultation uh, proposes a similar approach and timeframes as, as the EU. So three months um, from uh, the position becoming law to continue 
using uh, the old EU SECs for new deals, and then a further 20 month, months from then to repaper any arrangements um, which are based on the old EU SECs with, with your new approach, so IDTA or new EU SECs plus addendum. So next slide, please, Renzo. Before that, Michael, a question from the audience, please. Um, yep. And do uh, I don't think it's facetious. Do we expect reciprocity here? Will the EU recognise the UK IDTA? <laughs> Good question. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I think sometimes to a certain extent, as as we saw with the kind of Brexit discussions, there's there's the kind of legal negotiation and then there's the political negotiation, isn't there? And and I think various factors kind of play into that. Um, I've been interested to, to know. I thought the answer was simpler than that, Michael. I thought the answer was so? resounding. No way is the EU going to recognise the UK instrument. But um, maybe you and yeah. I. Yeah, <laughs> who knows? Maybe I'm slightly more optimistic. I don't know, Randall. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> okay. So next slide, please. Yep. So issue number two is the potential extraterritorial effects of the UK GDPR. Uh, this is necessarily quite a theoretical um, topic, and so I'm raising largely for kind of information purposes rather than going into a detailed analysis. And as a general comment, this and the other two issues which I'll come on to seem to mark the ICO kind of opening up for discussion points which are um, uncertain or even kind of firmly established under EU law and, and guidance. So post-Brexit, is there the possibility of firming up or rethinking approaches to, to certain points? The consultation raises three extraterritorial scenarios um, and sets out two options which could be pursued by the ICO um, with a comment on the ICO's current proposed preference. And, and the consultation also explains various factors which, which, which go into uh, consideration. So first scenario relates to Article 3.1 of the UK GDPR. So whether an overseas processor of a UK GDPR controller processing data in the context of the activities of the controller's UK establishment is caught. Therefore, theory, theoretically, a US cloud storage provider or an India-based technical support company processing data for a UK customer. Uh, the ICO flags various factors which need to be considered, such as the breadth of the language of in the context of the activities, um, and also highlighting that, well, if we deem uh, the, the processor to be caught, would that enhance the level of protection for controllers and, and for data subjects? Uh, ICO concludes uh, that they have a preference for um, saying it depends on the circumstances as to whether the, the processor is caught. And the key reason provided is that in the language of Article 3.1, there's no express mention to processors. And so maybe, and this isn't the ICO language, this is just kind of some uh, supposition, maybe feeling it might be overreached to, 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 to fold that in. So from a practical perspective, I mean, a key consideration is, is obviously the overseas processor would still be subject to, to Article 28 terms. And so what would be the additional requirements on it as a processor in scope. So perhaps greater regulatory scrutiny, um, certainly accountability obligations, but as Renzo mentioned, there's um, early stage discussions about some of those being scrapped. Um, and also kind of practically would um, entities be handling the data in, in any way different if, if they were in scope compared to just subject to the Article 28 terms. So quite a bit to think about there. Uh, moving on quickly, the, the second scenario relates to Article 3.2 of the GDPR, so whether an overseas processor of a UK GDPR overseas controller um, is processing data relating to offering goods and services to UK data subjects or monitoring their behaviour is, is caught. So theoretically, an analytics provider in Canada um, acting as a processor for a US ad tech company 
um, in respect of UK individuals' data. So similar factors arise in respect of scenario one as, as um, here, and the ICO's current intention is to say that those processors would be in scope and would be caught. The rationale provided is that the processors' processing activities as part of the services must inevitably relate to the offering of, of goods or services or monitoring. Scenario three is whether an overseas joint controller of a UK-based joint controller is caught. So theoretically, entities who sort, set cookies for, for kind of joint purposes. The ICO flags the low threshold for joint controllership as set out in the CGAU's Facebook fan page judgment, but leans towards option two. So it depends on the circumstances. Again, on the rationale provided in um, scenario one, saying that there's no express mention in, in the UK GDPR. So plenty to ponder on extra territoriality. Uh, next slide, please, Renzo. So issue number three, the, the concept of a restricted transfer. And as a reminder, a transfer um, uh, is, is restricted where it's from the UK to a country outside of the UK, which is, is not deemed adequate. And, and obviously, we've got the kind of rollover of um, adequate, adequacy decisions in, in the UK from the, from the EU for the time being. The ICO suggests two examples of what might be carved out from constituting restricted transfers and thus subject not to uh, requirements around data transfer mechanisms, TRA, supplementary measures, etc. So the two examples are first, um, where there is um a transfer uh, or transfers which aren't from one uk legal entity to to a non-uk legal entity and sorry the the two examples provided are are where an employee takes a laptop outside the uk or a uk company shares data with with an overseas branch perhaps an attempt to remove kind of de minimis transfers red tape but query whether the, the there might be a more of a focus and risk required. So what if the data to the overseas branch is health data or of interest to surveillance authorities and so subject to greater protection? Uh, second example of the kind of carve out is where there's a transfer from a UK processor, i.e. supplier here in the UK, um, at the instructions of its, its non-UK GDPR controller, i.e. advertising technology customer in the US. And then finally, the ICO is reconsidering its position uh, that there's no restricted transfer to a non-UK controller or processor to whom the GDPR um, applies. So result of this, perhaps series of flow charts and maps to, to be clear on application and scope. Next slide, please, Renzo. And this is the, the final one from me. Uh, so derogations, and as most privacy professionals will know, these are intended to be a kind of pseudo last resort for transfers. So if you can't transfer to an adequate country um, and then you can't put in place a transfer mechanism, then can you uh, consider the application of derogations? Most commonly cited is explicit consent, but the established position is that that can't be used for repetitive transfers. And indeed, regulators have historically flagged um, the kind of clear drawback that consent doesn't carry the protections of adequacy or, or data transfer mechanisms. So the ICO has raised whether we should revisit their use. And in particular, and interestingly, uh, the regulators asked whether a data transfer mechanism, so IDTA or EU SECs plus addendum, UK addendum, could be used for a transfer, but then for the processing, which isn't subject to uh, appropriate safeguards, so fails the TRA, fails um, after the supplementary measures have been put in place, can you rely on explicit consent for that element of the transfer? Um, consent often perceived as a silver bullet, but clear downsides, a uh, high threshold for validity under the, the UK GDPR, um, it can be withdrawn, and obviously there's a broader public discussion happening at the moment around consent fatigue, and so query whether um, the position and the guidance will or will not change post-consultation. So with that, I'll hand over to 
Kirsten. Great, thanks, Michael. So um, I'm going to be talking you very briefly through the um, transfer risk assessments documentation that's been published as part of the consultation. If we skip on to the first slide. Now, all of this, the transfer impact assessments from the EU and now the transfer risk assessments, as they're being called for the UK, this is all coming out of SHREMS, which very sadly, um, we still have to be mindful of in the UK. So a very quick reminder of SHREMS. Um, it was said that you could use your standard contractual clauses, but additional measures may be needed. And you have to look at each um, transfer to the third country on a case-by-case -case basis. If you are transferring to a country that has essentially equivalent um, protections for the data, then fine, go ahead. If not, then you have to think about whether you need supplementary measures. And, and we have the European Data Protection Board guidance on what those might be. So, uh, so depending on what the, the outcome there, you may or may not be able to transfer your data. So next slide, please. So we had the EU SCCs, the new version, um, now in place, and there's some of the SREMS2 um, helpful measures have been built into those contracts, but that alone is still not sufficient for EU transfers. So for EU transfers, you do still need to do your transfer impact assessment, and you still may need to put in place your supplementary measures. Next slide, please. And the, the EU approach to doing your um, impact assessment, and this is based on the EDPB recommendations, is you do your fact finding. Um, so what is your transfer? Then you identify your transfer tool, i.e. your standard contractual clauses. You do your adequacy assessment. So this is looking at the laws of the third country. And then if needed, you look at your supplementary measures. So um, do they overcome any inadequacy in the laws there? Yes, fine, go ahead, do your thing. No, then don't transfer. Next slide, please. Now, how does this compare to the um, transfer risk assessment guidance and toolkit that we've now seen from the ICO? Well, I think the first um, point to note is actually that the, the, the risk assessment toolkit is not for all um, assessments. It's only for your routine restricted transfers. So, and we heard earlier about a restricted transfer, what that is. So it's only to be applied in that circumstance. And it's only to be used if you're using the IDTA. Although it does say in the guidance that it's going to be helpful for assessing other um, transfers under other mechanisms, such as BCRs, for example. So there is it, it, it's caveated in that there is a, a limited remit for use of the um, TRA toolkit. It also says within the guidance that it is not for complex transfers and it's not for high risk transfers. So complex transfers um, might be, and they give an example of, for example, uh, you've got multiple um, importers in different countries and from a high risk perspective, um, for example, it's the sort of um, processing that would require a data protection impact assessment. So the guidance says don't, don't just rely on this transfer risk assessment um, toolkit for those sorts of transfers. So if you can't rely on the TRA for that, what should you do? Well, the guidance says that you ought to carry a more carry out a more detailed risk analysis, and also you could consider relying on another mechanism or um, the exception. So the, you know, for example, consent. Um, and you may we may want to seek professional advice. So I think really what this is is um, the, the guidance is trying to, it's trying to simplify how you do your transfer risk assessment, but is acknowledging at the same time that actually. Um, there might be some sort of high risk, highly complex transfer, transfers going on, which you can't use this for. Well, actually, a lot of organizations that have, for example, shared services within the group where you could have, um, say, your HR systems being accessed from multiple countries around the group, then you're not going to be able to use the, um, the TRA for those sorts of transfers. And that probably will be you know, a lot of the sorts of transfers of data that are going on 
on a the usual basis within organisations. The next slide, please. Oh, just back one. There we go. So, um, how do, how is the TRA tool working? The the transfer risk assessment tool. Um, working. It's actually not too dissimilar to the EDPB way of doing things. So first off, um, you do your fact finding. Um, well, and actually part of that fact finding is checking, um, and this is different to the EDPB guidance, is checking that you are actually GDPR compliant. And that makes sense to add that in as a specific step within the tool. Because of course, if you haven't got a lawful basis for processing the data in the first place, for example, then what's the point of then assessing your transfer to other countries? So um, then you move on to looking at the facts around the actual transfer. So that's the same as the EDPB. You also look around, uh, look at the facts of the laws of the country to which it's being sent. So here it's slightly different um, in that it divides this up into two phases. So, it, so the EDPB um, sort of mashes that together. The, the TRA tool first off gets you to look at the, the laws of the country in the sense of have they got a broadly equivalent or they, they call it similar um, data protection uh, requirements in that country and laws which are going to protect the personal data in a similar way that to, to the protections in the UK. And then having done that assessment, you, you move on to the second phase of the assessment, which is looking at the regime within that country around access to personal data and requests from third parties. And then thirdly, what you also look at um, is the harm to the data subjects. And what's quite helpful um, by breaking it down very clearly within the tool um, and, and within the guidance is that they say, well, actually, even if having done the assessment of the laws in that country uh, and you find them to be wanting, if you do the assessment of the potential harm to data subjects and find that it's really low, well, actually, that's not disastrous. So you, it, you may well be able to still rely on the IDTA. But at that stage, what you might do um, if, it, if it's low risk to data subjects, then go ahead. If actually you find it's not low risk to data subjects um, and the laws are lacking there, then you look at what the extra steps are that you can take to reduce the risk to data subjects. So this is similar again to the EDPB. This is the supplemental measures stage. Then having done that, if everything is okay, you've, you've managed to reduce the risk sufficiently, go ahead with your transfer. If not, then the, the TRA is potentially not suitable. But actually, the, the, the guidance doesn't completely close the door on the transfer. Unlike the, the EDPB guidance says, well, don't do the transfer, the, the TRA tool says, well, if that's the conclusion, then potentially look at either doing a more in-depth assessment or look at whether other transfer tools might be appropriate. For example, could there be exceptions that you rely on? Kirsten, so I have to draw a close here. We have a minute left. So okay. um, I think you're on your last slide, aren't you? I am. I'm on my last slide. So um, it's, it's, it's a much more friendly um, way of doing things. It's really helpful because it includes lots of checklists. Um, and I just wanted to end on saying that actually in practice where I think we're going to end up in a lot of cases is a combination of the EDPB's way of doing it and the UK way of doing it. So it's a transfer impact assessment plus the risk assessment. And you heard it here first. It's the tiara is what I think everyone's going to be doing. <laughs> That's, thanks, Kirsten. Um, actually, just uh, in terms of practice, that if you're doing a European one, that is so much more comprehensive. Um, it's going to cover the UK requirement. And if you're doing a European one, when you're also in the UK, it's going to be a complex transfer anyway. So the UK at the moment doesn't have an answer for how to do it with their toolkit. So thank you very much, Kirsten. And thank you very much, Evan, for joining us. So that's it. Um, I, I do trust it was helpful. Um, you know, do reply to the consultation if, you, if you're keen to do so. Um, I hope you um, 
Uh, so we hope we answer most of the, well, we haven't answered many questions and there are a few more. So we will follow up in writing to, to those of you that have asked some questions already. We will send slides, we will send a link to the recording. And just to give you a trailer for other webinars coming up in the next three months, we're going to cover direct marketing and developments there. We're going to do one called the top 10 CJEU cases that every privacy professional should know. And we're going to do a webinar on China's new people or people law that a lot of our clients are asking us about at the moment. And we're helping them with our Chinese colleagues. So thank you very much, everyone, and have a lovely rest of the evening.